Okay. Greetings. I am here. Greetings. I am here in the gallery of Tibet House U.S. 22 West 15th Street. Uh, the um, the Dalai Lama's cultural preservation uh, destination organization uh, in the United States. And uh, I'm sitting in the midst of a, new, of a wonderful exhibit put together by our curators, um, Zola Nyambu and Gandan Thurman, uh, on the Declaration of Independence in February 13, 1913, that was done by Tibet, uh, the Tibetan government um, just after the fall of the Manchu Empire. Uh, he had been in exile in India with the British uh, for a couple of years at that point. And uh, he, because the Manchus in their very last spasms of control of China, the Manchurian people, who are not Chinese people, by the way, in case you don't know that, they were a conquest dynasty who conquered the Chinese people and ruled them for 300, uh, um, uh, uh, not quite 300 years, a little less than 300 years. And um, they fell apart. There was a Chinese rebellion against them in 1911. And so then the Dalai Lama, Sarji Dalai Lama, went back. There was a, a, a garrison there which he had sent back uh, to them. He did, he did not ha uh, execute them. He had them sent back home to China. And he then declared independence. And what that was, was in the context of um, that the Manchu Empire had had a protectorate relationship and a sponsorship relationship of the Tibetan government and the Tibetan nation. And which really, the Tibetan nation is a very natural entity because they live over two miles altitude, between two and three miles altitude, on the Tibetan plateau, you know, the roof of the world. And nobody else can live there year round. They get heart disease and the women miscarry because there's only 45% of the world of the oxygen at sea level available to a person. So it takes a special adaptation that takes many generations to achieve, and the Tibetans had achieved that. So he, he said, well, we no longer accept any relationship to China because the Manchu Empire is now gone and their sponsorship of our government, of our spiritual government, is no longer there. So now we are an independent nation and we have, our, we have and then he created a flag, he created a postal service, he created a mint for coinage, he created an armory uh, to make um, uh, sort of, uh, weapons for a defense force and he sought the help of the British to do this. And then not only that, but uh, so here this show many things like the map and the agreement he made with the British in 1913-14 and the, what's called the Simla Convention, which was a treaty publicly made between the Tibetan government and the British. The nationalist Chinese government was also present, but they were not present representing Tibet, they were representing themselves. So therefore the British were recognizing Tibet as an independent nation de facto by being in that in that negotiation, that diplomatic negotiation. The Mongolian people recognized his declaration of independence. The Nepali government at the time recognized his declaration of independence. And the British did. But then later, the British reneged on that, actually, very tragically. And uh, so, you know, it was, never, it was never really broadcast to the world, this Tibetan independence. And the Dalai Lama didn't have a venue. There was no internet. There was, he couldn't make a YouTube. <laughs> His declaration was in a big, giant um, uh, proclamation, which was put all over Tibet, and he, you know, officially February 13th, 1913. So actually, February 13th should really be, for Tibetans in exile and around the world, their Independence Day, like their July 4th. And even if, under negotiating, a autonomous Tibetan Republic within a Chinese Federation, like you have autonomous Buryat Republic within the Russian Federation, you have the autonomous, you know, Tuvan Republic in the Russian Federation, you have, you have different autonomous republics. This would be the future, but even if that was the case, independence should be celebrated by Tibetans on February 13th. On March 10th, they do celebrate the massacre of Lhasa, where they tried to expel the Chinese invasion forces to protect the Dalai Lama in 1959. But that's really not their Independence Day. That's a kind of rebellion day. You know, it's a specific battle which they lost, unfortunately, to the overwhelmingly, you know, you know massive Chinese forces. But they were more or less unarmed, the Tibetans at that time. Uh, so that's not really their Independence Day. That's their tragedy day. You know? But Independence Day should be this February 13th. And it doesn't matter if this is not contravening by, by, by promoting this and having a 
Letting the world know about this now, all too late, we are not undercutting at all the Dalai Lama's promise to the Chinese government that he, they will accept being part of China if they have genuine autonomy, if they have one country, two systems, if they have a local government that has control of Tibet's environment and economy, uh, then they are willing to cede, in, like in the old Manchu protectorate, they're willing to cede foreign affairs and general federal control um, you know, to the Chinese government with a loose reins policy, uh, you know, without being internally occupied by Chinese army and Chinese troops, without having prison system, uh, gulag system enforced by Chinese that they will not tolerate. So that does not undercut the fact that Tibet previously was independent, does not, and, and intrinsically kind of is independent, does not undercut being autonomous, which means virtually independent within a federation. That's perfectly able to, just like they were within the Manchu Federation, you could say, or those days they call it empire, Manchu empire, but they retained their local government and their independence in their local arena. And again, the Manchu sent money actually to build objects and things of value. They s supported the spiritual tradition. They defended Tibet occasionally when they were invaded by the Gurkhas from Nepal. And so, and some Mongolian, renegade Mongolian types. And so they were useful and helpful to be in a federation at that time as well. So I just want to be clear about that. We're not necessarily, there are some Tibetans who feel that there should be no acceptance of autonomy within China because Tibet is independent and that's free to draw that conclusion. We are not arguing for that conclusion necessarily. We follow Dalai Lama's conclusion that just because they were independent doesn't mean they couldn't agree to federate with China as an autonomous entity. That's perfectly okay. If it's valuable to China and valuable to Tibet, both sides get something out of it, it's not a problem. So it's like the 13 colonies of the United States. You know, you have Virginia and Rhode Island, the very different places they join up for mutual benefit, voluntarily, no problem. So this is, uh, this is the point of this exhibit, and then we're having some seminars here, and I will speak there, and just to give you a tiny preview, and I want it out to be on the YouTube internet. I personally saw, with my own eye, in 1984, in the British East India Library in London at the Embankment, a street called the Avenue called the Embankment, with the Dalai Lama at an exhibit of documents relating to Britain's relationship with Tibet, I saw a letter written by Winston Churchill, the young Winston Churchill in 1923. I remember that date and I remember his signature, Winston Churchill. And in that letter, he was refuting, and I'm sorry, I cannot remember whether it was Sir Charles Bell, who was the British plenipotentiary to the Himalayas, to Tibet and other Himalayan entities, or whether it was to the Governor General of the Indian colony, the jewel in the crown of the British Raj, whether it was to that Governor General. But in that letter, Churchill was giving Whitehall, that is the British Foreign Ministry's, verdict that they were not about to introduce the Tibetans as an independent nation to the League of Nations, so that Tibet could join the League of Nations, which the 13th Dalai Lama wished to do at that time, 10 years after his declaration of independence in 1913. And he said, it is not that we don't know they are an independent nation, we do. We have our independent relationship with them and trade things and, and we have uh, embassies in Gyanze and we know that. But it is that they don't need to worry about official independence to the world because no one will ever go to Tibet. It's too inaccessible. So they always will be independent. And I, you know, the Raj doesn't have to worry about not having Tibet as a buffer state on its northern frontiers. So, and we get commercial advantage from Hong Kong and Canton by letting the Chinese feel that we believe they do have Tibet because they're always trying to say we own Tibet. So why should we argue with them and upset them? Even though we know they are free, because if they'll never go there then anyway. The Chinese will not go there. They just, it's a fiction that they like, and our business people in making contracts with them and doing business with them have a nice thing by saying, yeah, we gotta let you guys have Tibet. So this sellout of Tibet started back then. The British had a treaty with Tibet, and yet modern British diplomats will say, no one ever recognized Tibet. The American government, Road independently to Tibet, a request to go through Tibet with a, with a road to supply the nationalist Chinese against the Japanese during World War II, which the Tibetans didn't agree to for whatever their reasons. And, and so the American government recognized they were independent. The Americans didn't go ask the Chinese nationalists, can we make a road through Tibet? Because they couldn't have allowed them because they didn't control Tibet. 
So the Americans actually deal, dealt with to them like an independent country, and yet they will all lie, in the, or in diplomatic speak maybe, they will all tell white lie. They think it's white lie, but it isn't white to Tibetans. And they will pretend that they never recognize Tibet. And this is kind of a diplomatic genocide, you could call it. You know, like, do you people never existed? You're just a kind of Chinese, which is the way the world leaders do treat Tibet, actually. And um, this is not good for them, and it's not good for China, because it makes China feel they can somehow assimilate Tibet and no one will notice. It's like they're like Saddam Hussein with, the, with Tibet as their Kuwait, and they grabbed it and annexed it and occupied it and colonizing it nowadays and oppressing it nowadays and genociding the Tibetans nowadays, and they're going to get away with it because no one will ever speak up for the truth, the historical truth about Tibet. So for that reason, we are having this exhibit, and we are fascinated by the, all the events surrounding the great 13th Dalai Lama, the previous incarnation of our great 14th Dalai Lama, and his declaration of the independence and the freedom of Tibet. So we are all welcome to come visit the free exhibit and um, look at the different proofs that are assembled here, which are just some of the many proofs that exist about this thing. And, and we can undo Winston Churchill's sneaky policy in the future, somehow, someday, at least historically, get the record straight.